looking kind of, and I told her it had been raining here for a couple of days. Yeah. So. We needed the rain, but I'm ready for it to stop now. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of gloomy. Yeah. yeah, it's gloomy out. Thank you for responding, Beth, with that, with that question. You bet. And guess, yeah. well, guess what, Dr. Chapman? What we're going to do next month, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about recidivism. Uh -huh. And talk about differences between states and, you know, why states may be different. Uh, so I'm going to have Sarah, I'll probably co-present with her on that. But I think it's kind of important that we kind of talk that through and um, why numbers look so different between states and stuff like that. So I appreciate yeah. that email. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just, I was just curious and saying, what, how did they warrant a, a, a story, a full-blown story about reduction in recidivism? They're right next door and, yep. you know, what did they do? Yep, yep. But you, you, but you explained it, you know, when you have a significant high rate and you do something and it comes down, then, there, you know, you see a significant difference. So... Yeah, and we always have to look and see how they measure things. Every every state measures a little bit differently in terms yeah. of what yeah. recidivism yeah. is. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to do apples to apples. Yeah. So I'm going to say Rick is not probably going to join us. I have not heard anything from him. So Becky, do you mind leading the meeting? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you, at least you know you're kind of prepared with technology that you might have to step up, so... <laughs> yes. So I'm going to be back, looking Becky. at the agenda. Okay. Um, but anyway, I will officially call the meeting to order and welcome everybody who is in attendance on Zoom. Um, the first order of business will be approval of the July 10th minutes, if anybody would like to make a motion to approve. I move the approval of the minutes. Second. Did, any, but did you second, Larry? I did. All right. All those in favor of approving the July 2020 minutes? Aye. 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 <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Um, with that, we will approve the minutes of July. Our next board meeting. Uh, will be October 2nd at the 8th Judicial District in Ottumwa at the residential facility. Um, once again, I expect that we'll just be playing that by ear. Um, hopefully we can meet in person, but um, if not, I will get all the information for another Zoom meeting. Uh, with that, I will ask Dr. Skinner for the welcome and director's update. You got it. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we would love to have uh, Warden Weitzel with us today, who is um, the, the warden for New Newton Correctional Facility, but she has some things going on right now, uh, unfortunately, she's dealing with. So uh, we can't have her today, but I just would like to say again, um, thanks to you all and your ongoing support. Um, I'm gonna give some updates Basically today, what we're gonna cover is uh, some, issue, some areas around population management, uh, some of our COVID mitigation strategies, since we're still, we're still deep into COVID, uh, and then Steve will be talking about the budget. But uh, for my update, I'm really gonna focus on population management and some of the COVID mitigation strategies and some of the data points um, that I wanna share with you, how we're doing. Uh, I will say overall, uh, we, we have done an amazing job. If you look at other states, uh, in terms of what they're dealing with COVID in prison. You know, it's like, again, it's like a Petri dish and we have been able to uh, have COVID in three of our prisons uh, with some significant spread and have been able to contain it. So for example, Fort Dodge, I think we got up around 300 positive cases. They have no positive cases right now. So the efforts of the leadership, uh, the staff um, and their dedication to um, keeping staff and individuals incarcerated safe has just been Nothing short of extraordinary, I must say. Um, so with that said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the population looks like in the prisons currently. So as you all know, in March, early March, we were about 22% 20, over capacity. 
Today, we are approximately 6.8% over capacity with our prison count as of this morning, 7,406. Um, since March 1st, uh, we have had 1,661 parolees and 492 work release released and the prison count has declined by 1,108. So we've had you know, a, quite a drop of over 1,000 uh, since March in terms of uh, our numbers and our population. And of course, as, as a reminder to you all, which we've talked about over and over, that we, need, we knew we had to make space. Uh, being 22% over capacity, we knew we had to create space in our prisons to be able to, when there was positive cases, to move people around, uh, put them in um, you know, soft or hard quarantine, um, try to keep those away from the, the healthier individuals. So we really needed that space and it has worked out very, very well and to our benefit. Um, since April 1st, the Board of Parole has completed 6,666 reviews. About 43% of those reviews have resulted in an approved a release decision. Um, so on May 1st, there was over 640 individuals who were actively incarcerated who had been approved by the Board of Parole for release. Um, currently, we have 329 incarcerated who have been approved for release uh, awaiting placement. So that's, um, since then, um, the reduced the number of incarcerated individuals approved by release by 311. So again, creating more space uh, in our prisons. Finally, I just wanna share another thing about what we've done with population management, which you all have been aware of, I believe is, uh, since May, 2020, we have shut down admissions twice now, especially because we've had two separate occasions where we've had spread of COVID in our Iowa Medical Classification Center. So despite those two admission shutdowns, we, we were still able to bring in about um, 950, indiv indiv 950 individuals in from jails. Uh, right now we have about 214 um, individuals that are sitting in jails that are waiting to come to IMCC. Uh, we're being very thoughtful, methodical, admissions are open. Um, we're just making sure that we uh, have enough space in case there is another outbreak. Uh, so we continue to monitor that. Um, like I said, our classification team and Bill and his team have done an excellent job uh, managing the flow into our prisons and moving people around the state in a very safe, safe manner. Um, so that's what I have for the population management. Before I talk about COVID, do you have any questions about the population or things that I could answer for you all. No questions? Ready to move on to COVID? I decided that- No. I, okay, okay. <laughs> I've decided that, you know, I used to really like the word positive and now I don't like it anymore. It's taken on a different <laughs> meaning for all of us, I believe, but let me just give you some brief stats on COVID and what's happening across uh, our prisons. So um, I think these, some of these numbers are pretty mind blowing in terms of the amount of testing that we've been able to do. And that's, I also want to do a shout out to uh, Iowa Department of Public Health um, has been the, in the state hygienic lab. Um, our medical, uh, you know, our medical staff here at, at IDOC and county, local county public health have all been teamed up to make this happen. I mean, it could not have happened without the partnership with, with our medical team and county and, and state public health. So the total test administered to date is 11,094. Mm -hmm. This is on individuals incarcerated. We have tested 2,058 staff and we continue to, to test staff. If staff want to test, we will provide them a test. Um, so total tests, 13,152. So total positives to date since March, since the pandemic has started, we have had 833 um, individuals incarcerated test positive. Uh, 126 staff have tested positive, and this includes um, community tested uh, cases as well, community-based corrections, for a total of 959 positive to date. So I want to talk about specific prisons now. Um, as you know, IMCC, the classification center in Mount Pleasant, are currently battling with, with COVID in their prisons. And let me, again, want to say they're doing an excellent, excellent job uh, managing that. 
our incident command team here at Central Office that includes a lot of our medical team, talks to them on a daily, uh, daily basis around strategizing movement and testing uh, protocols and things like that. So it's just been, it's been an amazing joint effort. So at the classification center, uh, total positive cases are 194 offenders. 160 are from this last outbreak. Remember, because we had two outbreaks. And 33 staff, 15 from this past outbreak. Total recovered is 243. 209 from this recent outbreak uh, for the individuals incarcerated and 26 staff and eight from this recent outbreak. The remaining positives right now we have at IMCC is 50 individuals incarcerated and seven staff. Uh, since the start of this outbreak, we have, we've had 2,274 tested with a 7.03 or a 7.0% positive rate, okay, of all those tested. Now, as you probably know, some people have been hospitalized. We have a due to have a population that does have some, you know, compromised, uh, you know, medical conditions that may compromise them if they get uh, test positive for COVID. So as the start of uh, in March, in terms of hospitalizations, we've had, um, we had 14 offenders from IMCC sent to UIHC. Uh, we've had four total deceased and all these individuals and Dr. Greenfield, correct me if I'm wrong, has some kind of underlying medical condition. Two of them refused treatment. Um, and so, um, so we've I have a total of four that we've lost uh, due to COVID, which is very unfortunate. Two remain in ICU, uh, one's on a ventilator. Uh, one is housed in the COVID floor at UIHC and 10 have returned to the general population at IMCC. Uh, any questions about IMCC before I talk about Mount Pleasant? There, you have a question. I do have a, qu a quick question. Sure. Was the spike, or, uh, I know what, you know, living in Johnson County, uh, was the spike related to the students coming back at, at uh, IM? CC? Yeah. You no, know, we can't say that for sure, but if I was, you know, and I can let Dr. Greenfield chime in, but I, I'm gonna say there has to be some kind of connection because they their positivity rate was, you know, was very, very high and so, it's hard not to think that there was some kind of connection between what was happening in the community, therefore what was in, impacting IMCC. Would that be a correct assumption, Dr. Greenfield? I, I think so. And you know, I'm concerned about the whole southeast quadrant of the state of Iowa where those numbers have been uh, exceptionally high. And I think they were even worried about that before the students got back to Iowa City. I, and even so, the, the spikes in even more rural counties like Henry County and Lee County and, and uh, Des Moines County and Burlington, those numbers have been high. Um, and we have seen uh, officers' uh, uh, numbers go up, especially at uh, Fort Madison. So I think it's a, you know, once again, it's a combination of a lot of things. But um, uh, at the end of the day, the good news is that we've been able to, I think, get a hold of it. Uh, very quickly, especially at Mount Pleasant, and I'll let you get to that, Beth, but, um, but at IMCC, um, it was, the, the, the team just did an amazing job of corralling all of this, but, uh, but Larry, to your point, uh, I, I do think the students are a contributing factor, but the geography itself, I think, is probably a bigger factor. Okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Dr. Greenfield. You bet. So in terms of Mount Pleasant Correctional Facility, and as many of you know that Mount Pleasant Correctional Facility is a minimal, um, minimum type facility. So it's very dorm, you know, like very dorm style. So you can see four to six guys in a room, which can be very problematic when you have positive COVID cases in a prison. So you can imagine how quickly things can spread. Uh, and again, they've done an amazing job in terms of, well, I think we're on the, on the downhill side of that in terms of flattening the curve with Mount Pleasant. But so the total positive cases at Mount Pleasant is 172 offenders. Um, two were from July and seven staff. Uh, total recovered so far are 42 offenders and three staff have been recovered. The remaining positives we have at Mount Pleasant Correctional Facility is 130 individuals incarcerated and four staff. So on 9-2, we tested September 2nd, tested 699 individuals incarcerated with 119 positives, which resulted into about a 17% positivity rate. 
Mount Pleasant will be conducting uh, approximately 564 tests on 914. Uh, in terms of hospitalizations, uh, a total of six individuals incarcerated have been sent to UIHC. One has been admitted to the UIHC, UIHC this morning. Two are in the infirmary at IMCC, and three are housed uh, at IMCC pending and return to Mount Pleasant. So again, at Mount Pleasant, it's, it's very, um, things are evolving, and uh, we have a lot of testing strategies in place. Um, we get updates daily from Mount Pleasant in terms of the movement when we get test results back, but uh, they seem to be moving in, in the right direction and are doing a terrific job in terms of uh, containing the spread. And Dr. G, is there anything you want to add from your part as from the, our, as our medical administrator? Well, and again, it's, it's, it might be anecdotal, but it, it just seems that at Mount Pleasant, we were able to catch it maybe a little earlier than at Fort Dodge. Um, some of the, the gentlemen uh, told us very quickly. Um, I almost hate to say this, but we just, some of, I, I just wonder sometimes if there's different strains of this virus. Um, some of the people at Fort Dodge in general, and again, this is a very generalized statement, overall just seemed a little bit more ill mm -hmm. thus far than the people at Mount Pleasant. And could it be just the populations are different? I realize there's other variables, but um, at least at this time, things are going fairly well, given, as Dr. Skinner said, the openness of the dorm setting and <clears throat> the actual physical layout of the facility. Um, I'm very pleased with the, the progress that we've had and uh, the medical follow-ups that I've had with Dr. Morris, the staff physician there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Greenfield. And I, and I appreciate your leadership during this time. Um, and, then, and that really is really kind of the key things I really wanted to share with you today is, is giving you an update because that's kind of what we're deep into right now is population management and response to COVID. But uh, I'm very confident in our staff uh, and what they've been doing. They've been working long shifts. Um, you know, they're really the true heroes working on the front line. We have a great leadership team in place. Um, I feel very confident where we're at. We knew this was an, wasn't an if, it was a when. And so I'm very proud of the team and what they've done. So um, I just want to give a shout out to the team. And we'll continue to fight COVID. And I can't wait to, to, to a point where we all can get together again and talk about different things other than COVID mm -hmm. and population yeah. management and talk about some of the really good things that are happening too as well. So uh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Beth, a quick couple of quick questions. Sure. What's our turnaround on testing? What kind of testing are we doing and when do we get the results after the test? I'm gonna kick that to Dr. Greenfield because that has varied a little bit. Uh, it used to be uh, within 24 hours. Yeah. For the most part, we're, we're probably seeing it now, I'd say probably an average of 36 to maybe 48 hours. It's still pretty quick. I just think the volume of late has just been so high. I think the State Hygienic Lab under Dr. Pentella has done an amazing job, uh, but it's still, I think, much quicker uh, the way we are doing it with our direct liaisons with the State Hygienic Lab compared to other testing sites. And let's, let's also realize that the testing that we're doing, in my opinion, is much more sensitive than some of the rapid tests that you hear about. Um, we decided not to do some of those because we saw mixed results and inconsistent results uh, with that testing. I know they advertise it and, and the results can come back quickly, but you, I don't know, there, was, there, were, there were cases that were inconclusive, there were cases that didn't match uh, when we did the swabs. So we've decided to, although it takes more time, go the, the safer and more sensitive specific route with the nasal swab. So I'd say in general, probably 36 to 48 hours, which I still think is a pretty good turnaround time. And are we uh, doing other kinds of monitoring like uh, temperature checks or anything else besides the testing to kind of keep tabs on what's happening at, within the facilities? There, Screening goes on in all nine prisons every day. Officers are doing random temperature checks, wellness checks. Um, all of that is going on. I think uh, after these experiences, um, the other six prisons that haven't had an outbreak are, are, are highly uh, invested and keen in the awareness of what's going on. We talk to the wardens about this on a regular basis. And are there, are there privacy concerns? Do we share who's got it with the general population or with other staff? Or 
how do we get, because I know there's uh, a lot of entities that say we can't divulge those names to people. Is that, are we operating under the same types of constraints within the uh, in, prison system? In terms of the, in, in terms of the, uh, our incarcerated individuals, the names obviously go to public health. We do, with their permission, contact their families to let them know what's going on. Um, but with inside the, uh, the confines of each prison, they would all be on a specific uh, uh, medical isolation ward. So people, you know, in, indirectly then would know who had it. Okay. Because of their location of where they're being housed. All right, thank you. Yeah, and, and one final comment. I saw the, the chat box and, and Dr. Greenfield, I want you to chime in as, as well. Um, the condition of people's, you know, psychological, emotional states during quarantine. We've been at this now since March, um, you know, with restricted movement. Uh, I will tell you, I have been to every prison that has had positive cases. I've been in the COVID units, all geared up in PPE, um, talking with individuals incarcerated, talking with staff, um, letting them know, yeah, some are very frustrated, but understand that this is a moment in time and we're doing everything we can, talking about the why, why this is important to keep them safe, to keep our staff safe. Uh, trying to, you know, of course, as Dr. Greenfield mentioned, um, medically making sure we're, we're keeping track of these individuals and talking with them. We have great psychologists. Um, and so that's also uh, something that we want to pay attention to as well as is emotional and health and the well-being of individuals. Um, trying to get them outside for air. Um, getting them access to books and things like that uh, to keep them occupied during this time. And I have to tell you, overall, from talking to the individuals incarcerated in these units that have been in these units for like days and days um, with multiple people in their cells, they've have had a pretty good attitude understanding that we're going to get through this and that we're looking out for them and their safety. Um, Dr. Greenfield, anything you want to add in terms of the psychological aspect? Well, as, as you said, we, we have a full staff of psychologists at every facility. A psychiatrist is on call 24 seven. Uh, nursing is making two to three times a day. I mean, personally, you know, myself, I had COVID and I never saw a physician the entire uh, two weeks that I was ill. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think we're, we're providing outstanding medical and psychological care to our, our people. The other thing we have to remember is Things have changed a lot since uh, the early days. I mean, there was a time when if someone tested positive, we kept them in medical isolation until their, their test was negative. And for some of those, it was four to six weeks. Well, now with new knowledge and CDC guidelines, what we're finding out is after six to seven days, once a person is positive, they're most likely not contagious. So we've dropped that medical isolation period down to 10 days. We've also allowed them to have more of their personal property, a lot of fluids, Gatorade and water every day, allow them to have books, music. I think these things uh, help pass the time uh, so much better than what we were doing in March. But in March, we just, we just didn't have as much uh, knowledge in our, in our wheelhouse. Now we have a lot more and hopefully it will provide much better psychological outcomes for our patients just because we have so much more experience. Thanks, Dr. Greenfield. And that's all I have for my updates at this point in time. Okay, thank you. And thank you for addressing. I saw the question on mental health come up, but I wasn't sure if I could find that again. So thank you for addressing that. Certainly. There was another question that came up on the chat as well regarding population control. And it asks, what is the status of utilizing compassionate leave for those incarcerated individuals who are more vulnerable due to comorbid orbdites. Yeah, sure. Um, what we've been doing basically is, uh, is we're not doing anything considered compassionate release. Um, we're looking, uh, we have looked at um, all, that we've been working with the Board of Parole uh, very closely um, at looking at potential cases. We looked at people that have, uh, that are 60 and over, or those that have, you know, um, significant uh, health concerns. Uh, what their eligibility be for parole and if they would be a good release because um, we have to also co course balance public safety. Um, so we have uh, Katrina Carter, who is our Board of Parole liaison, has done a terrific job giving, getting lists to the Board of Parole of potential people that would be good for release. Um, and we have looked at those medical, the people that have, are medically compromised to see if there's potential there to get them out. Um, but we're looking, at, we're looking all across our population in terms of the best candidates 
um, to get them out and um, safely in our communities. All right, are there any other questions before we move on? Um, I guess I do see a question. If, are we using CDC data to determine who's at risk and what is the standard? Do you wanna go ahead and address that now? Dr. Greenfield, do you, do you, do you wanna address that? Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's ever changing. The, the, the rules change a lot, um, but we, we look at those updates all the time. We have, you know, regularly and Dr. Spadani and Marty at the Iowa Department of Public Health. We also use county uh, public health agencies, um, especially in Webster County, uh, Johnson County, and, uh, and Henry County. But yes, we keep up with those guidelines. And actually, we're doing more than the guidelines state. Uh, recent uh, uh, CDC guidelines for uh, um, institutions came out. And we not only use masks, we use procedure masks as well as plastic shields. So in some respects, uh, we go above and beyond what the CDC recommends. Thank you, Dr. Greenfield. Uh, any other questions? I'm not hearing any. I think it is time to move on to the budget requests. If you're ready to present. Steve? Sure. Hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, first, of all, first off, I want to apologize for the lateness of the information coming out. Uh, we've got a, a lot of balls in the air right now um, with, uh, of course, the the COVID uh, response. We've got CARES Act funding that we're trying to solidify. Um, we've got year-end close. We've got just a lot of different things uh, happening, financial reporting and such. So I do want to apologize for the, the lateness of getting the information to the board members. Um, the, there was no uh, purpose behind that. It was it was basically just getting the information finalized and, and to you. So first off, I wanted to apologize for that. Um, we've been asked kind of a, to take a little bit of a different approach um, as far as our budget request this year. In the past couple of years, we've been told um, by Department of Management and, and the governor's office that uh, we should come forth with a, a status quo budget request. Um, we're not saying that that may not still happen, uh, but we've been asked to, to maybe look at it in a, in a, in a way that we phase in um, over a couple different phases. We have a status quo phase. We've got a uh, phase that basically has some of those uh, essential uh, increases that we know are gonna happen. And then that third phase of, of enhancements to our system that can basically uh, make us do uh, things, things a little bit more efficiently uh, and better for our client population and our staff and, and such. Uh, so that's kind of how we're going to walk through this today is what does it mean with the status quo? What does it mean with those those increases being met? And what does it mean for uh, some of those enhancements? A lot of the themes are very similar to, to last year as far as what we're asking for. Uh, we actually, in the, in the process before COVID happened, um, the governor had actually recommended several of our um, initiatives to be funded uh, in, in different uh, amounts. Uh, so we want to, you know, kind of hinge on that and, and kind of build on that. Uh, but at the same time, look at other things that in our system that have changed since then uh, and, and, and make sure that we're asking for all of this. We know uh, based on the financial uh, abilities of the state at this point in time, it's challenging time still. Um, there, there's still a lot of fluctuation in the revenues coming in. Uh, so do we anticipate getting everything? Probably not, but I think we need to ask for it. I think we need to make a good faith, a concerted effort to let uh, the, 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 the legislature and, and the governor's office know what our needs are. So that's kind of, I wanted to kind of set the table as to uh, how we were gonna proceed through this. So, um, and I don't know if Joanna, are you available to be able to put the, the slides up? Share the screens, okay. So we're gonna start with the status quo. What does that mean as far as status quo? So we've got a $386 million budget uh, for the Department of Corrections currently. Um, of course, status quo means that that's not gonna change. 
what what uh, holes are there currently? Uh, we we had a shortfall coming into this year, so you know before we even talk about increases and such for next year, we've got to solve that problem for for the current year. About 11 million dollars of a shortfall uh, that we're seeing in 2021. Um, at, at and then when you I like to equate this to uh, our biggest uh, expenditure is of course payroll. So uh, we want to kind of show you what does that mean in in terms of payroll. So with with uh, salary and benefits average probably about seventy thousand uh, dollars. That eleven million dollar shortfall would amount to about one hundred and fifty seven employees, uh, full time staff for a full year. Uh, the second piece of of what's missing at this point in time would be um, those increases that we know are out there um, that we would we would expect are going to happen, um, and some of those things that we're going to ask in that second phase. Uh, there's a little over two million dollars of, of additional shortfall there. That's another 30 employees at that seventy thousand dollar level. Uh, the third piece, of course, is kind of an unknown at this point in time because we don't have all the the information. There's still some bargaining that's happening um, in regards to salary increases, uh, which is the only thing that can be bargained. Uh, but the other piece that we don't know is what is that health insurance and, and uh, dental insurance and those types of things. What are those increases going to be for that? Uh, we, we don't have that crystal ball, uh, but based on what we've expected in, in the last couple of years, we would expect that to be probably in the amount of about $10 million. Um, so now that's another 143 staff uh, at that level. So when you add up all those three pieces, um, the shortfall this year, the additional expense that we expect in, in 22, uh, and then that salary adjustment, we're talking a, a considerable amount of money when you're talking about 20. $3 million, uh, which would amount to about 330 staff. So wanted to lay that out there. That's our that's our first building block. Um, if we came in with, with status quo, that's where we're headed. That's, that's what we have to basically fight against at this point in time. Now, there are some opportunities right now with um, our population being down, um, and we're investigating what that means to us. Um, so we do, we are building some strategies as to how we would deal with that. Um, but, but really and truly, the, the whole would exist until some of those things would be implemented. Um, of course, all uh, contracts, all staffing, everything um, is reflected. We currently have uh, a total of about 3,670 uh, staff that are budgeted at this point in time, um, but we do have a vacancy factor that's a sizable amount of money going into 21, about $6 million. So, we're already holding positions open to be able to afford those 3,670 staff. Uh, we currently have uh, about 230 uh, FTEs that are vacant right now. That's kind of fluctuating. We're not necessarily sitting on positions, um, but it's one of those things that's, um, that we just have a lot of turnover right now. Uh, a lot of people coming and, and going, and, and so we can't even necessarily keep up, but what we're trying to, to, to keep those staff on. Um, so that's that first building block of, of status quo. So now if we move to the second slide, um, and then 23 is the same thing. So this is a two-year budget cycle. We've got FY 2022 and 23. Um, so we would, of course, um, see similar types of increases in 23 um, and, and, and would build us a bigger hole if we had to have a status quo budget for, for two years. Okay, Joanna, if you can move to the next slide. Okay, so now we get into what are those things that um, that we know are holes um, or expenditures uh, that we need to have filled in order to uh, sustain and, and really be at a real true status quo of what we have now that we can afford going forward. So we've got a number of things on this, this spreadsheet, and this is once again the FY 2022 uh, sheet. First uh, one, of course, is your funding for our vacancy savings. Uh, just short of $6 million scattered across our, our department um, where we're basically intentionally holding some positions open, not all, um, but some positions in order to, to afford uh, everything that we've got budgeted currently. Um, it's one of those things where it's a strategy. We, we hate to give up the positions um, just for the fact that we know that we need them at this point in time, um, but, but that's a, a significant amount of this total is this vacancy savings uh, and in making that whole and letting us afford those positions that we have on the books. Um, 
Second piece is our pharmacy um, to central office. So what this would entail is um, it, it's kind of unfair, uh, I think is the best word, to uh, Iowa Medical Classification Center um, to have the pharmacy, statewide pharmacy, spend on their budget. It inflates uh, for something that they really have uh, not complete control over. Um, uh, so basically what we're doing with this package would be to move that funding to central office, uh, to a central office appropriation, and be able to uh, get uh, Oakdale or IMCC's uh, operations really to reflect what their budget is um, and, and really put that pharmacy on its own um, so that they're not having to um, hold positions open and do other things for that statewide uh, purpose uh, of the, the pharmacy spend. So that's about $8.3 million in the current budget. Uh, as we move forward, we'll, we'll see that there are some increases built into that, but uh, for, for the purposes of this, um, $8.3 million would be moved, would be our current budget. The third, third column kind of goes into that pharmacy. We actually did have uh, a spend of closer to $8.9 million this past year. Uh, so we would be asking for a $500,000 increase to our pharmacy budget uh, to hopefully make that whole um, and not have to dig into uh, other places and or uh, try to try to find that money in, in other ways. Um, one of those things that's another kind of unknown right now is how that population uh, is going to affect the pharmacy spend. Right now, of course, our, our population is down, but uh, we were, we do foresee that rising some. Uh, we just don't know to what level uh, based on the courts opening up and um, getting those folks that are sitting in, in county jails uh, into the prison system uh, and not holding them in, in the jails at that point. So $500,000 would be added uh, to, once again, a central office pharmacy uh, appropriation. The fourth area is icon enhancement. So currently what we're doing, um, the, the, the ICON appropriation, which is our A21 appropriation, does not, um, does not have enough money to, to be able to do everything that we need to do uh, as far as enhancements to that system. Of course, the ICON is our offender um, case management system uh, and, and a lot more than that even. Uh, all of our medical and, and classification and everything is, is in that system. Um, so we do have constant things that uh, allow our, our employees to be more efficient um, and also just fixes that need to happen from time to time. Um, this would allow us to not have to use um, other funds uh, to pay for those. Uh, for instance, in this past year, we had uh, nearly $500,000 of spend that was outside of this appropriation for purposes of, of enhancements or fixes to the ICON system. Uh, we feel that the $1 million, and there's a lot of things that we had to hold off on. Uh, we would have loved to have did, done, uh, but we just didn't have the ability to, to fund it at that point in time. So the $1 million would allow us some flexibility to get some of those things done um, and also not have to dip into other funds to uh, perform those enhancements. That, that fifth column, OCIO increased billing. Uh, we were recently given rates uh, from the, the office uh, uh, chief information officer uh, at the state level. Uh, these are what they foresee as increases for FY22. We don't have future years built in at this point in time. They haven't given us that information, but uh, we feel that $390,000 is significant enough to our budget that, that we feel we need to ask. That's an additional cost that's being put on us uh, that, that we feel uh, we don't want to use existing dollars to, to fund. Um, we really, because this is above and beyond for current services that we're being provided. Um, once again, we don't want to have to hold positions open um, and or delete or remove positions or uh, curb other spending to be able to afford this. So we want to ask for that $390,000. The last one in this column is uh, grant replacement for the 7th district uh, and for FY22. Uh, they currently have a uh, uh, probation parole officer three uh, position that's funded uh, through a grant with the Office of Drug Control Policy uh, for a safe neighborhood in the Southern District uh, amounting to the $120,000. Um, what this person does, um, they collaborate with local law enforcement and local community agencies uh, to enhance the public safety 
uh, by increasing services and monitoring to high risk violent offenders. Um, what this would do if they didn't get this, um, right now I believe that this serves 27 clients uh, that are the highest risk uh, of clients that we have in our population, which is level fives. Um, number one, they're gonna be not gonna be monitored at the level that they uh, are currently being monitored. The second piece is the treatment is going to be drastically reduced. Uh, currently, uh, they're, they're being given programming dosage of about 1300 hours in addition to those PO meetings uh, where they're getting uh, evidence-based manage case management and core correctional policies for another almost 1,000. So really you're talking about almost 2,300 hours of treatment to these uh, level five most high risk uh, offenders that would not be able to be done uh, by not having this position. Uh, so basically what this is doing is this is funding the, the PPO3 position that was previously uh, funded through the grant. So that's a real quick um, uh, summary of, of what that position does. It, it is trained and, and conducts MRT programming um, for those high-risk offenders. Um, so very valuable piece to the seventh district operations, uh, and we feel worthy of, of asking for replacement dollars uh, in, in this budget request. So for FY22, uh, for this second phase um, of, of our ask, uh, it's about an $8 million increase, uh, a little over 2%, 2.07%, 2 uh, with the bulk of that once again being that funding of those vacancy savings that we uh, have on the books, uh, forcing us to basically hold some positions open throughout the year. Any questions on that, that piece or any one of those? And, and I forgot to mention, if you've got questions as we go, feel free to ask. Don't feel like you need to save things to the end. So. Um, does anybody have any questions on the F122, this middle phase? Um, yeah, Steve. So uh, the first figure, that $6 million figure, again, does that, is that just covering the FTEs we keep, are keeping open, or is there a built-in for the salary increases in there some, somewhere, or anticipated salary or benefits increases? Yes. So that is just our, Larry, that's a great question. Um, that is just the existing cost of those staff that we're having to leave vacant. So once again, we don't have that uh, a figure necessarily for those salary increases uh, for uh, 22 or 23. Uh, that will be a blanket ask, I guess, um, of whatever that, that is calculated for salary adjustment, that that would also be uh, asked for. Uh, I think we've done that similarly in, in our letters that we've sent over uh, in the past, where we basically say uh, salary adjustment, that, and that's why this was number one on our list, salary adjustment is basically needs to make us whole. So this plus uh, those increases for 22 that we just don't have those figures yet, that would be first and foremost on what we'd be asking for. Okay, thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Okay. okay. Joanna, if you want to scroll down to the to the next page. So in FY23, um, so this same same phase, we're in this necessary increases basically that we're we're seeing. Um, so we got year one, now year two of the budget. Uh, we're going to ask for another five hundred thousand dollars of pharmacy spend. Um, once again, this has been one of those things that has gradually increased. Uh, we don't want to have to um, once again. Uh, take money from other operations uh, to fund the pharmacy. It should be a self-sustaining uh, operation, uh, and, and, and that's what we want it to be. So year two, we would ask for an additional $500,000 uh, to go into the pharmacy um, that would be administered by central office. The second piece of, of FY23 uh, that's known at this point in time is a grant replacement request for the, the second judicial district. Uh, currently, they have a uh, grant that uh, basically has three uh, FTEs, uh, community treatment coordinators uh, positions uh, that are expanding the treatment into their um, rural areas uh, through technology. So there's a piece of it, of course, that is the, the salaries of those three uh, positions. And then there's a piece for the technology itself. Um, they've implemented uh, tablets, um, uh, that basically are used by those uh, clients that are in those rural areas so that they don't have to travel. 
they don't have those uh, inhibitors uh, of being able to, to be provided the treatment. Um, so that tablets, the actual purchase has been done, but there's licensing and there's renewal uh, and cellular support on those tablets that needs to be paid for. So that is part of this request. So there's about out of the 340,550, uh, $279,000 is three staff. There's about $61,000 or a little over that's actually for those uh, licenses and or the cellular service on those devices. Um, a little bit of background on this, uh, this, this grant. Um, so they've got Zoom licenses for connecting with clients remotely using tablets uh, designed by American Prison Data Systems, connect uh, community corrections clients living in rural Iowa with community corrections professionals in their communities. Uh, these cellular data enabled tablets have allowed community corrections professionals to provide the right amount of supervision and treatment dosage to moderate to high risk clients in their rural communities and so I've got and over barriers uh, and overcoming some of those barriers based on uh, non-reliable transportation, lack of internet access. So basically what this is doing is it's, it's enabling that treatment capacity. Uh, it's boosting that treatment capacity in, in, in the second district. Second district is kind of our, our pilot for this uh, through this grant. Uh, we would hope uh, in future years to be asking for additional uh, dollars uh, to implement this in, in other districts that have uh, rural components. Um, and, and most likely that would be all the other seven districts. Um, so so what, what do those three staff do? Um, they, uh, they have about 432 clients per year um, that they're, they're serving. Uh, if we didn't have this, uh, it would reduce our treatment capacity programming hours by about 1,300 hours. 1300 hours. Um, those people that in those rural environments would not have that, that access to treatment, uh, which is probably gonna lead to more convictions um, uh, based on, on not, not uh, allowing that, that, that change. So there is uh, some additional small costs for a vehicle um, uh, and, and some mileage as well that, that's uh, also in this, but for the most part, it's those positions and the uh, tablets and or cellular service. So. Once again, one of those things that we think is essential for um, continuing. Um, they're still in the, in the phase of evaluating this, um, but everything is pointing to the direction that, that it's been a valuable piece to their operation and, and is enhancing their safety and security of their uh, population. Any questions on these two proposals that would be for FY23 for that middle phase? Steve, where are the grants? Uh that are expiring, are they federal grants or what kind of grants are they? I believe that they're both, uh, well, this, this one is an o ODCP, I believe, um, or the first one is ODCP, so that's money that's coming, I believe, from feds through the governor's office, basically, drug, drug control policy, and is then secondarily coming to us. This one, I believe, is also um, federal, um, in some way, shape, or form. I don't have that information right in front of me as to what agency is, is giving the money, but yeah, it's an expiring federal grant that, that basically we're just asking for replacement dollars to fund those operations. Do we know other, other are we making other grant applications out there for FTE positions or, or is that There's, available to us? There's not a lot that are out there right now uh, and, and none, no other ones that are expiring. So Joel did, did, did say this is a direct grant from the Department of Justice, um, Bureau of Justice Assist Assistance for the second district. Um, so it is a direct federal grant. But yeah, to answer your question, I don't know that we, we don't necessarily always seek um, dollars for positions because we, we know at some point in time that's at risk. Um, of, if we don't get funded of, of it not uh, being around. So a lot of the times when we ask for federal funding, we're actually asking for, um, uh, other things besides people, um, but there are a couple out there. I know, I know we've got one in central office right now uh, that's through, uh, it's a BOCA grant, so through the, the attorney general's office. Um, so that, that does fund a position, but yeah, overall we, we try to discourage um, that just for the fact that we do have to go make that ask and it's not a popular ask um, to the to department of management for uh, people, more, more bodies. 
But we see the benefit in both these cases, and, and we're going to advocate. I think we advocated, I think, the last year uh, for uh, some grant replacement dollars in the 8th district, and that was funded. Um, so anytime that we can see where there, there is benefit to our system, um, we're, we're definitely going to make that a priority in our, in our budget asks. Okay, thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and move to the third phase. So our third phase is those enhancements to our system. So as you can see, those green ones have, have remained, um, and now we're adding to that with these uh, yellowish-orange uh, packages, which enhance our system. Um, those first two, uh, institution treatment and the CBC treatment, uh, we had made an ask uh, for a considerable amount of positions in, in last year's request. I think we asked for 20 positions uh, for treatment in the CBC, and we asked for uh, 13, I believe, in, in the institutions. Um, when that went through the process uh, with the governor's office, um, they proposed uh, setting up pilot uh, institution and pilot districts, a small and a large, uh, to enhance that, that treatment capacity. Um, so that's Based on the buy-in that we got from, from the governor's office, we thought that that was probably the right approach to ask this year as well, is to go into that phased approach. Um, once again, that was actually going to be funded prior to COVID. Um, so we want to try to try to get that uh, built back in and, and hopefully um, get that funded so that we can you know, institute this additional treatment in a large and a small district. I think it was six positions in a large district. Three, dis or three positions in a smaller district, uh, boost that treatment and see what those results are. Same thing uh, in the institution level, uh, it was four positions at Mount Pleasant. Uh, so expanding that institutional treatment at Mount Pleasant, uh, see what the results are, and then go back for hopefully an additional ask based on um, those results being what we would anticipate that they would be. Um, so those are our first two asks are exactly what we, um, a phase of what we had asked for last year um, and what was going to be funded prior to COVID. We think that that's probably the be best bang for our buck. Uh, once again, knowing that there's not uh, a ton of uh, additional money out there this year, this is more of a conservative approach um, that we, we hope will be uh, funded once again. The third area is our housing vouchers. So just a little bit of background, um, there is a grant that we applied for, uh, coronavirus emergency supplemental uh, funding, CESF funding through Burn JAG, that is federal dollars. One of the things that we asked for was housing vouchers. So what does the housing vouchers do? We're looking at ways to uh, release either from prison or from even from a work release facility a residential facility, those folks that housing is one of those barriers to uh, being able to be released. They don't have a, a solid uh, place to go and live. Uh, everything else is, is fine, but that is the barrier that they have. Uh, this is one of those things that we think we can help with. And I think it could be a very beneficial to not only to those, those clients and those incarcerated individuals, but also for our population management, um, uh, getting some of those folks out sooner than they would otherwise. Um, what this would do and what it currently does, we've got the grant currently for 75 uh, clients at, you get the first two months of your rent um, up to $500 a month, and there's a little bit of flexibility there if there's special circumstances of extending it an extra month or, um, or, or such, but this would allow 100 people in, in this in the continuation of this pro program, 100 people to uh, receive those, those vouchers. Uh, once again, to assist them in getting uh, out of, of prison and or the residential facility if, once again, uh, the housing is a barrier. The example in the, in the residential facility that comes to mind is you've got somebody that's working and working and, 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 and they're doing everything they're supposed to do, but they just can't save that money um, back because they're paying their rent to the facility, they're paying other bills and such. This allows them that little bit of a boost uh, to get on their feet, uh, establish, get out of the facility where they're not paying that rent and, and save up a little bit of money so that they can hopefully continue that uh, housing after the two months is, is done. So once again, it's a little bit of a boost. Uh, we, we see a lot of benefits in this. We actually have just started uh, implementation with the grant. Uh, I think we've got a couple uh, clients that are we're actively moving uh, forward with. 
uh, but we anticipate this could be something very valuable for our system. The last area is our institutional education, and this is another one that we had asked for the previous year, um, and we're asking for $300,000. Uh, we feel that this is necessary to boost um, some of the priorities that, that the governor has and that we have in our department as well. Um, we want to uh, provide uh, additional uh, GED high set testing uh, for a, a larger portion of our population. Uh, and this would allow us to do that. Currently, we're serving through the community colleges uh, as many as we can serve. Um, uh, there's not a lot of additional or room or capacity. This would expand that capacity um, and allow us to serve more of our individuals, have that education being met um, in, in a way that uh, is going to benefit them beyond uh, their stay with us um, and hopefully going to provide additional opportunities once they get out. Uh, we know that education is very important and, and we want to provide every opportunity we can. This would allow us to, to provide more opportunities to more clients. Um, so that's, that's kind of a real quick introduction on those four um, priorities for FY22 uh, for our enhancements. Um, Joanna, if you want to go ahead and move to the, to the last page. We really don't have anything because those, those dollars would once they're appropriated, if they were to be appropriated, they would continue into the to the FY23. Um, so at this point in time, we don't have any additional enhancements in 23. Um, uh, but once again, this is the two-year cycle. We will have an additional opportunity next year uh, to put forward another budget request for FY23. Um, but we really wanted to get those things on board for 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 22. Get the ask made. Uh, and if we have to come back and, and submit some of those things next year again, uh, we would we would definitely do so. So as you can see, um, not a ton of of dollars. So Joanna, can you go to that previous screen once again? That's number five. So can we scroll the way to the right? Yep, there we go. So we're at 2.42%, um, about $9.3 million of increase with all these things considered. But really and truly those yellow ones it does no amount to a lot of, of dollars you know, when you're talking about just those by themselves. Uh, you're only talking about $1.3 million and, and a 0.35% increase. So not a lot. Um, but once again, as we talked previously, we need to get those basic needs met first, uh, which are those green sections. Those green sections are to basically continue our operation as we are today. Uh, and, and maybe enhanced by not having those vacancy savings where we have to leave positions open. Uh, and once again, the other ask that's informal in this in this manner is that salary adjustment um, for 22 and then again in 23 once we know those figures. So before we proceed to the, the capitals and the technology, what questions do you have on on any of these three phases that we've talked about? Uh, Sally made a comment under ch chat about the VOCA grants, and I'm not sure I understand what that was. Could, uh, Sally, could you tell me what that was in response to? So the VOCA grant is ongoing, so it shouldn't. Be. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, the VOCA grant, the good thing about that, that's an ongoing grant. We do have to reapply for it, but um, those those don't tend to be anything we have to ask for a replacement. That's the reason why we went for that one. It's, it's kind of in the whole world of guaranteed, it's the most kind of guaranteed grant that'll just go on and on for us. But to your point, Larry, we at the time each fall when the grants come out, we ask the districts to let us know if they're planning on applying for one and remind them that we all have to be on the same page in order to ask for the legislature to um, continue funding, because we know that we've had issues with that being an issue before. Okay. You that's, bring up a, you, yes. Yeah, because that's my concern about asking for nine F, new FTE concerning 660. It's not so much initial, but you, it's an ongoing expense after once it gets put in place, right? Right, exactly. And so to your point, that's what we've been trying to tell the districts, if you're going to apply, get us in the loop so that we can defend it or support it. Otherwise, it's not going to be replaced. 
Okay. Yep. Good and point. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't sound like there's any other necessarily questions. We can always revisit if something comes to anybody's mind um, as we move forward. But so now we're going to move into the capitals. Um, so the capitals, we do have some additional projects that we're going to ask for this year and some, some uh, changes as far as the amounts and such too. Uh, the, the list did grow a little bit, uh, and I think there's good reason as to why that's grown. Uh, the part that's tricky with the capitals is we're supposed to ask for a five-year cycle, five-year cycle. So this would be FY22 through FY26. Um, but really and truly, a lot of these projects have value uh, to our system, and, and we feel really belong in those first two years. Um, once again, if asked, we, we can reevaluate, we can possibly move those, some of those things, but I don't know that anything rises to the, to the level where I don't think it's necessary to, to put in these two year, this two-year cycle of funding. Um, so we'll kind of go through real briefly some of those, those projects, um, uh, especially the changes that have been made from previous years. The NCF, Dietary, and Laundry were both on there, uh, changed dollar amounts just a little bit from the previous year, um, so that would... The dietary, of course, uh, provides for updated equipment um, that they can't afford on their own uh, due to budget constraints. So these are very large ovens and, and, and types of things uh, that, that, once again, can't necessarily fit into a, a normal uh, budget uh, as such. The laundry, same type of thing. This is replacement of actual washers and dryers uh, in their laundry uh, that are very expensive commercial size um, that they can't physically, once again, do within their existing budget. The third one is, is an interesting one, uh, and, and I threw this in here. I think it's important to, to put in. Uh, due to the duration, um, we had some, some outages at, at some of our residential facilities. Um, so all of the districts, so we did a poll of all the districts and which ones had uh, generators of some type at their facilities. Well, the only district that had entire, uh, all their operations for uh, residential um, was 5th District. That was the only one that had at both their locations in Des Moines um, had backup power. So what this would do is this would provide uh, temporary or portable generators that could be moved throughout uh, to respond to, to the emergencies. Once again, during the derecho in Cedar Rapids, um, the residential facility was out of power for a number of days, um, and, and that dis disrupts a lot of things. Safety and security of both staff and, and the clients that we're serving um, uh, and this wasn't just, of course, in our facilities, the whole entire uh, area was, was affected, but these, these generators would actually assist in, in continuity of those, those operations. Um, simply, uh, some of the door controls, the air functions, um, the temperature controls, um, in addition to being able to do our case management uh, in our ICON system, getting those ins and outs, uh, knowing where people are at all times. So there's a lot of benefit to putting that in there. Um, once again, this is, this is one that we crafted fairly recently. Um, so this would put some sort of temporary or portable generators in all those districts that do not physically have uh, that capability at their, at their locations. So $105,000. The sixth district also has a bulletproof reception windows um, for $15,000. This would at their locations of Cedar Rapids, Coralville, and um, I'm trying to think the other team, I believe, was the other location, would provide uh, bulletproof reception windows. So um, normally that, that secretary is the first person in their safety plan. Uh, if they're not able to uh, be at a distance or be safe, they can't implement and let everybody else know uh, that, that something is occurring. Um, so what that would do is it would allow that, that capability, uh, give that time for that that secretary or, or receptionist or, or assistant uh, administrative staff to be able to uh, alert people if, if something was going wrong, um, provides that safety and security. Uh, the, the cooling tower at West Union was on the previous submission. Asbestos removal for the first district at Waterloo was also on this previous submission. Uh, and the tuck pointing uh, for Waterloo, uh, the Fifth Street office was also on the last submission. So kind of, and that's kind of our health and safety area. Construction, renovation, and uh, systems is kind of the other grouping of, of projects. There are some additional things here. Uh, a lot of them have been on here in some capacity. Several of them have. 
Um, and actually the, the CCF kitchen was in the process of being funded last year prior to uh, the COVID outbreak and, and uh, some, some funding issues with, with the RIF fund. Um, the, the first district tr group treatment space uh, was on the list. So we enhanced that value a little bit based on uh, inflation and, and costs going up. The Burlington residential facility, same way. Uh, we, we feel that that's a very important, needs to be replaced um, very desperately. Um, so that would provide some, some funds for that. The kitchen at, at Clorinda, once again, uh, we're hoping that, that maybe this year uh, it will get funded uh, in addition to some of these other projects. One of the new projects is our ASP air conditioning, uh, and we'll see that kind of down below here too. We were under the assumption prior uh, that, that that was covered with major maintenance funding. Um, well, we've been told that since that system doesn't exist, it's not an enhancement and doesn't qualify for major maintenance. So we feel that this is one of those things that needs to be put on um, uh, this, this request. So we've got $924,000 for three living units at ASP that do not have air conditioning. Uh, once again, comfort, security, um, a lot of benefits to having a, a controlled environment um, that, that is comfortable uh, for our staff and for our uh, incarcerated individuals living in those units. Um, the seventh district Davenport residential was on there once again last year. Uh, once again, we've increased the values. Uh, NCF treatment space, this one did change a little bit. Uh, this was on for a much smaller uh, building uh, in a different location on their complex. Uh, but now we've, we've added a tremendous amount of, of capacity. And, and this kind of goes along with some of the, um, the discussion we had in the general fund request where treatment, you can only do treatment if you have the staff and if you have the space. Well, right now, NCF Newton does not have the space and probably doesn't have as much uh, staffing as they probably could, could use. Uh, but the space is prohibiting us from, from reaching some more people currently. Uh, so putting this building in place would definitely enhance that. Um, I believe it would be about 28,000 uh, square foot uh, building uh, that would be able to um, meet meet the needs better of, of what they're they're attempting to do with their treatment. Uh, once again, NCF is our sex offender uh, location where we treat uh, or provide our sex offender treatment program uh, within the institutions. Um, so we would hope that we could enhance. Um, and get people into treatment sooner by putting that building up. NCF hot and cold water loop system. Um, this is one that was added this year. Uh, pretty sizable amount of money, $8.8 .8 million. However, we've had issues over and over and over again with that system. Uh, we've had to experience leaks on an ongoing basis. Um, so what this would do is it would make it a permanent uh, fix rather than continuing to go back to uh, the state for dollars on, on a maintenance level, uh, we would replace that system with something that would uh, last us a number of years and have some warranty and, and such. Um, like I said, we've gone through several uh, leaks and it seems like it's on an, on an ongoing basis where, um, and sometimes it takes a lot of time and digging to be able to even find the leak uh, of where it is, but you know, thousands and thousands of gallons of water uh, leaving that system when, they're, when they experience these leaks. Um, so we think that's essential. The CBC uh, 5th District Fort Des Moines bathroom renovation, uh, another project that we feel is, is very valued at this point in time. I physically have been in that district and know of those buildings uh, where these renovations are gonna occur. Um, it, it's, it's very much needed at this point in time. Um, it's, it's a safety at this point in time, safety issue. Um, and, and just, you know, being clean um, and, and safe. I think that, that's the biggest thing for, the, for that renovation. But $710,000, that would actually, I think there's three restrooms in the 68 and 70 um, Thayer uh, buildings out at the Fort Des Moines complex um, that would uh, get complete facelifts and, um, and, and renovate it. So we think that that's a very important one to put forward. Uh, fourth district build an administrative parole probation office. Uh, this is another new one. Uh, this is an interesting one. They are actually setting aside some money as they can uh, over the past couple of years. I believe that they've built up to about $500,000 uh, that they're willing to contribute to this at this point in time. Um, and depending on how budgets go, um, you know, of course, they're, they're looking, how, how can they get this done? Um, what this would allow them to do, they, 
currently have a pro probation and parole offices throughout um, and are renting uh, places in, in Council Bluffs. So that would end that, make it one campus, uh, and also uh, eliminate that rent. They have some of their administrative in, in one of the buildings that has residential currently. Um, so by building this, this separate building for administrative and parole probation office, it would allow them to remodel that space uh, and actually expand their uh, capacity for their residential uh, facility. Um, I believe it was about 30 uh, clients that they were looking to add uh, based on uh, remodeling that, that space. So a lot of value there. Um, they already own the land, uh, so that's not something we have to procure. It's on their existing complex. Um, so once again, gets it into one uh, almost center where uh, beginning to end of, of their uh, supervision and or uh, holding in a, in a residential facility um, all in one location so it's more convenient and, and, and can kind of move forward. So then I think that that's a lot of value in that one as well. Uh, the Mount Pleasant air conditioning, um, east and west housing units, this once again, very similar to the ASP air conditioning has been on our major maintenance list. Um, once again, we were led to believe that it could be funded there, but I uh, have been told it can't, so we've added it here. Um, I have been through those those uh, uh, those wings uh, during the summer, and it, you know, even when you think about right now with what they're experiencing with the COVID, um, another thing that's stacked against them is that ventilation and, and that ability to uh, be in a more comfortable environment. Um, of course, it yeah. You know, there's a lot of things uh, for our staff and, and, and also for the clientele. Um, and comfort, comfort is only one of those things. Um, I think it does provide a, a security uh, aspect as well. Um, really gets everybody on, on, on a better even keel. And, and once again, it's unfair that those two locations uh, are different than the rest of the locations across the state. So um, based on where the, those offenders are being housed, um, it depends on if they have air conditioning or not. So that, that uh, project has also been added to this list. Uh, and then the second district, Marshalltown Field Office, this was on the previous year. Um, and, and basically all that does is that consolidates their probation uh, onto their residential uh, complex, builds a building on that complex so that once again, they're in a one uh, location for uh, their services in Marshalltown. So as you can see, $36 million for FY22, uh, approximately $20 million for FY23 um, that we'd be putting forward. What questions do you have or um, do you want to talk about anything more specific on any of these projects? Steve, the, the narrative that you sent us. Yeah. Uh, is is that in the order? Is that your wish list order, or or is there any any rhyme or reason to how you put those on that sheet, on that narrative? There, there really isn't at this point, Larry. Um, basically, it just got them all down with some descriptions. That's not a prioritization by us of of in any way, shape, or form. Um, that will have to be done before we enter um, for our our budget uh, request. But at this point in time, we wanted to get all the projects down on paper, um, get, a, get a broad description of what that would in, entail and what it would do uh, for you guys so that you kind of know what we're asking for. Um, if you have input um, on the, the prioritization, of course, we would, we would uh, welcome that. Um, but at this point in time, we, we know that um, we know kind of behind the scenes that the, the kitchen project at, at Clorinda probably is on the the highest totem pole just for the fact that um, they were willing to, to basically fund it last year before uh, the, the things came through. So, but we know all these things have value um, uh, in some way, shape or form and can benefit our system. Otherwise they wouldn't be a part of this, pro this process. Okay, okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. Okay. There's nothing further with the, the capitals. We'll move to the uh, technology uh, request, and I promise I won't go through each one of these projects. Uh, we have some some definite uh, things that have been added. Um, some of this uh, came forward. The stuff at the top, especially the statewide uh, replacements of of servers and uh, storage area networks and Wi-Fi replacement. Uh, we had a survey that we had to provide uh, the Office of Chief Information Officer (OCIO). Um, that basically asked for 
what are your, your projects that are going to be underway under the next uh, several years? And these are the, the statewide things are really what came forward, um, some, some immediate needs. Uh, and once again, as you can see in, in 22, I'm going to hit on the Wi-Fi network replacement just because of the dollar figure. Uh, but that really does benefit uh, all nine institutions, uh, all eight judicial districts, and also uh, central office. Um, a lot of value there. Um, there's a lot of things such as officers and counts, and you'll see some of that in your narrative. Um, Officers doing counts, um, remote desktop support. Um, also, when you're thinking about the incarcerated individuals, um, they get some of their testing for their, their high sets um, or evaluation of where they're at in their education through the Wi Fi. Um, they access post secondary education materials, they access their commissary, their banking, video visitation. All those types of things are, are based on that, that Wi Fi platform. Also, with all the districts and all the institutions, um, our, our, our tra training uh, is, is part of this as well. Um, so we think that this is one of those, those projects that uh, otherwise we wouldn't have included it on the, on the OCIO survey as well. But this is one of those things that where the technology, um, we need to keep up with the technology. Uh, what, what's there currently needs to be replaced. Um, and, and if we don't get this funded, we're probably going to have to find a way to fund it ourselves. Um, so that's, that's one I wanted to highlight. Um, there's another one down a little ways, uh, the second district tablet expansion for rural treatment, uh, the 134, uh, 764 that's in FY22. Uh, another one that's, um, I think, important, it kind of goes along with, with the uh, general fund request that we had uh, previously for the, the, the second district. Um, but Basically, we've got currently we've got um, this would expand that basically more so than anything uh, would add I believe 100 um, 100 more uh, tablets to the 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 roles so that we could get more people uh, involved in in that process um, and, and really expand that dosage and and treatment that that's capacity for those those folks. Um, so that that $134,000 would physically purchase, whereas the other the other requests in general fund, we'd already purchased those tablets. It's just that ongoing. This would actually purchase the tablets and then also provide a, a year of uh, the cellular service on those. Uh, we feel that once again, it, it's an enhancement based on um, the current uh, grant that they're they're working through, um, but we think we can do even more than what the, that they're doing right now. Um, Trying to think of other things that really pop out. Um, some of these things are just technology types of things. Some of them have come about because of, of COVID. You know, really we we found such things as the the six district conference room camera upgrade. We're asking for twelve thousand five hundred dollars in each one of the next three years. Um, COVID has has made us do things differently, and we have to think about that differently. Um, and and what our capacity is. So that would actually put in some Zoom um, uh, platforms into those rooms uh, and allow more interaction between our staff and our offenders uh, and, and treatment, provide treatment as such. Um, we've got several phone replacements, phone systems. Um, you'll see that as a kind of a, on several in the institutions and the districts both. Um, we've got a lot of systems that are archaic um, where the technology is, is no longer serviced um, they're no, nothing, the parts aren't even manufactured. We're having to, to piecemeal these things together. Um, so they become important to, to replace at some point. Uh, we have had a couple locations uh, decide that it was uh, important enough that without the funding to do it on their own. Um, but once again, dollars are, are tight. So that becomes a, an issue as we uh, kind of move forward. The other piece, we did have $500,000 that was given to us in this through this fund in the current year uh, and that was to do some of the building automation systems uh, provide the software and implementation uh, to an upgraded upgraded platform that uh, because the other one was not being uh, supported any longer we still have some panels that need to be replaced at a couple locations 
So you'll see panels for NCF about three fourths of the way down, $133,000, and also for Fort Dodge, $75,000. That replaces those panels that um, support fire alarm systems, HVAC, um, the hot water loop, uh, all those systems that are running, uh, the brains behind it, the panels uh, that eventually have to be replaced. So the software runs those, but the panels actually, uh, we still have a few panels in those locations that we don't think will get done with the dollars that were allocated this year. Um, so that's some of the larger things. Uh, another one that was added, uh, the ISP microwave hop for radios. Uh, and I had to ask, what, what is a microwave hop? <laughs> but it's, it, it's an enhancement to the uh, portable radios. Um, we actually had uh, upgraded that or trans transitioned that to a Motorola platform uh, a year ago. And so now we're, we're how do we better allocate or how do, how do we better use those? Uh, we want to be able to be on the ASIC platform and share information and be able to uh, call for help as needed. Um, what this microwave hop would do is it would enhance that um, and some of the outages that they have with, with that system. It would solve some of those. Um, currently, we're using the ICN, and there are times where the ICN is down, and, and, and you know, th then we wouldn't be able to communicate with the ASIC platform. This would eliminate that um, and use the ICN as a backup. Uh, in the case where something would occur with this. But um, really and truly, um, we think there's some, some value there. Um, and once again, one of those things where we're probably going to have to ask for additional monies in future years for uh, radios um, in, in other locations. So that's kind of a real brief. Once again, as you can see, there's a pretty significant amount of money here. Um, this is spread over the five years. Um, uh, 2.3 million in, in 22, about 1.4 million in 23 for projects. Um, and once again, not to say that some of the things out in those further years are not important. We do think that they're important, um, but we know that there's once again a limited amount of money there. Uh, we want to battle for that. And we see value both in the districts statewide and institutions as to getting some of these projects uh, funded. So. Once again, I didn't want to spend a ton of time on, on this, um, knowing that there's 36 projects or 37 projects. So, um, but what, if, what questions do you have? Uh, the, the, once again, the narrative will provide a little bit more information on each one of the projects. Um, the, the only other thing that I would add, I guess, before I ask for questions is some of these things you'd ask, you know, in, in your mind, you're thinking, wouldn't they just do this on their own? And, and the answer normally would be yes. Um, but once again, with budgets being tight the way that they are and scraping and, and um, looking for every dollar that they can, some of these things they haven't been able to do to the, 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 the point where they want to. Some of the computer replacements, some of the server replacements, some of those things, it's necessary, but you also want to keep the bodies uh, in, in seats as well and be able to provide the services to our clients. So um, that's why some of these, these projects are on there that you would think, isn't that just a course of normal business? So I wanted to add that to it. What questions do you have? I'm assuming, Steve, the narrative again for the technology does not prioritize, but you are kind of prioritizing when you're uh, putting in, uh, putting some of these projects out there for the 2025, 2026, et cetera, right? Correct, yeah. That would be the only way within each year we haven't necessarily prioritized. Uh, but once again, we will have to before we submit it to um, uh, Department of Management. Correct. Are there any more questions for Steve? All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, very in depth. <laughs> That's a lot to <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No. Certainly appreciate it. Okay. Um, with that, we'll move on to public comments. If anybody has a comment they would Wait. like to make. Do we need to approve the budget request, Steve, or not? Yes, and, and whether you do it today or if we had to uh, arrange another call or uh, meeting, but we do need to have something probably uh, approved uh, prior to having to submit it in, in October. So. 
Yeah, it, 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 and once again, I apologize for not having enough time to, for you guys to review it prior to this discussion. Um, so once again, we we probably can find another method, but if it can be approved today, yeah, we need a motion to be able to enter into our system. Let me ask you this. Yeah. When are you going to prioritize your things? Is that something that's going to be done before we would meet again, or or is that going to be something done later? You're talking prioritization of those those projects and the technology and capitals? Yes. That will have to be done prior to us uh, entering it into the budget system, which the budget, budget system closes, I believe, on October 1st. Um, so I think our next meeting is October 2nd. So it would have to be done before that. Um, I would envision that we're probably going to have some internal discussions in the next week uh, to firm up what that prioritization looks like. Um, and, and we can definitely get that back out to the board members uh, once that's done. Or once again, if you've got input uh, where you see value in some of these projects, uh, we welcome that input as well. And then well, this is, uh, this normally we, we submit a letter along with uh, asking, is there anything that's gonna be in this letter beyond asking for the salary increases and those kinds of things? So I would envision that that letter would be very similar if that's the avenue that we end up going, uh, which I uh, feel that we probably will uh, end up having that as our, our informal ask. Um, mm -hmm. Is yeah, I, I would think salary adjustment, of course, will be noted in there. Um, I don't know if we, I'd have to look back at several of the, the previous ones. If we've mentioned some of these proposals uh, in that letter or not, some of these things that where we feel value uh, both in necessary and enhancements uh, where we could specify those. Uh, we have provided, uh, once again, informally uh, to uh, those, those, those that make those decisions uh, as to what's being funded and not um, after the fact. So they, they will uh, get that information similar to that spreadsheet that we shared, uh, the three versions. Um, so basically the letter may be very similar to what we've asked you guys to, to basically sign off on in the past. Uh, asking for if there's money available, uh, we will provide uh, information as to what we could use that money for in addition to salary adjustment. If this is Mary, um, is there a way to, uh, uh, would we have time? I know that you have to have the approval before the first, but um, with the question that Larry asked about, you know, prioritizing and drafting that letter, um, if, you know, we can, have some kind of special meeting or something after that so that um, the, the chair of the board would have an opportunity to uh, see everything. And um, if he mm -hmm. has some comments or something, then he can do that at that time. So uh, I guess I'd like to see us defer it and uh, for that to happen. And I may defer to Joanna and Beth um, I'm assuming we can hold meetings at any point. All we have to do is give the notice and such to the public that the meeting's being held, correct? That's correct. We just have to find a <clears throat> a Friday that pi, or maybe we can do it during during the week that will work best for everyone. Yep. Yeah, yeah, this is Mark. Know, especially if it's virtual, it may be you know easier to get us together to uh, for that particular purpose. Yeah, I agree, Mary. This is Mark. Um, especially with Rick being gone today and, and Dr. Hill as well, I think it'd be best to give everyone a little bit of time to chew on everything that um, Steve presented. There's a lot of stuff there. And, you know, if we could set something up either next week or even the following week before the next meeting to, um, you know, make our motion to approve all the efforts, uh, I think that would be prudent. Yep, we Thank can do you, that. Mary and Mark. I, I think I saw a lot of heads nodding. So with those comments, I think we'll go ahead and um, plan to schedule another meeting for the official approval. Sounds good. I agree with that. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any public comments? It looks... Like we've got a question, is there a written policy outlining the criteria and the process 
to be referred to parole for possible early release during or because of COVID? Does anybody want to field that question? So the, um, Becky, so the board, the board of parole is the releasing authority. Uh, our role in this is presenting them cases of individuals that are um, with have good reentry plans and um, are we we believe ready for release. Uh, they've completed treatment. Uh, their behavior has been um, good. Uh, but in terms of like a criteria, that's that I feel like that's more of a board of parole type discussion versus us because they're in the end game. They're they're the ones that decide who's going to be. Uh, yes or no, approved or denied. But uh, we certainly work with our counselors to make sure they have solid release plans, housing plans, uh, services set up in advance and things like that. But um, in terms of uh, what we give to the board in terms of, of names and like, like a, uh, names for a potential release or to review, um, there's no specific criteria that we, we spell out or give. We just give the best candidates for, for public safety and reintegration. Okay. Um. So this is Daniel from ACLU Iowa. Uh, I have uh, two points I want to make. Well, two questions. Um, so one, Dr. Skinner, I one I got disconnected from the Zoom call, so that I might have missed something. Um, but I, if I remember correctly, um, you said about 200 staff people have been tested, and about 126 have tested positive. That seems pretty high. Can you talk a little bit about how does testing work for staff people? Are they required to get tested? Or is there something that happens before they shift? Like what, what does testing look like for staff people? Sure, that, that's a great question. Um, we take temperatures and screen the, every single staff member that comes into the facility. We tell them to stay home if they're sick or they are symptomatic. And if they're in, especially a, an institution that has positive uh, cases, uh, we offer testing. We do not require it but we, we, we highly recommend that they get tested. But also we know is that they're wearing uh, PPE, they're wearing face masks, face shields. And what we know at this point, and I can tell you from my own experience, been, being in positive COVID units and being face-to-face -face with positive COVID individuals, talking with them, that the PPE works. And so uh, we are making sure that um, staff have the, uh, the equipment to be safe and make sure that they, they stay home if they're sick or they have been exposed, uh, but we do offer testing. Okay. And then just very quickly, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the department is doing given the governor's executive order on, on felony voting? I know the department was doing work before the executive order. What it, since the executive order has been issued, what is the department doing now? Great. And it, well, basically we've been working with the secretary of, of state to do it. Um, secretary, secretary of state, could I get that right? Yes. And we're doing a, we're doing a data exchange with them. So a weekly data exchange. So for people that are discharging um, off a felony that are not, especially, you know, this, I think it's a 707, the ones that are um, the homicides and things like that. But those that are eligible, we are sending over um, weekly data exchanges over to them. Um, we also will be um, putting in a uh, paper or in, in everyone's discharge that gives them guidance and FAQs on how to register and things like that. So. Uh, the data exchange is already happening and we just finally got um, the, the language around the FAQ loaded into our ICON system that, that agents and counselors can download for individuals that are discharging. Yep. Are there any more public comments? Hi, this is Allison Guernsey from the University of Iowa College of Law. I was hoping I could just make a comment and then ask a follow-up question. So in listening to Director Skinner go through the COVID data, I have to say I, I had this feeling like everyone is being incredibly self-congratulatory, but actually we've had a lot of positive tests and we've had some deaths and I think those are incredibly tragic. One of my big concerns is that um, the mention of the outbreak at IMCC, it seems incredibly troubling. And I know that this is not the correct forum to talk about whether medical compassionate release needs to be enacted in Iowa. But I do think, um, and I, I guess this goes to my question, that this 
board and the Department of Corrections does play a role in identifying people who are particularly vulnerable under the CDC guidelines and then referring those people to see if they're eligible for release. And I know that you answered a question previously and said you're identifying people and you're making sure that they've completed their treatment and everything. And I, I'm just sort of curious what role their comorbidities, what role their particular vulnerabilities in terms of medical is playing into that and whether or not you're working with the governor's office or even people in the legislature to say, hey, look, we need to have a more structured medical compassionate release regime because COVID is really revealing that we've got some deficiencies. Well, and I appreciate, thank you very much. And I appreciate um, your comments. And, and we are, you know, obviously we're just as concerned in terms of keeping people safe in, in our institutions and our staff and individuals incarcerated. And we have been looking at, um, and Dr. Greenfield could probably respond to that too as well. We have been looking at those individuals that are on that kind of vulnerable side in terms of more compromise, but we also have to look at their, their sentences. Some are, a lot of them are life sentences um, that are, that are that have some of these long-term um, medical issues, um, we you know we like I said we continue to communicate with, with uh, the board of parole in terms of uh, the best cases, um, looking through a more tiered approach in terms of who are the best candidates because we also have to keep in mind public safety. Um, you know we try you know we have um, you know released uh, work the board of parole and we've tried to put. Uh, we really work with our counselors to get uh, get people out that have been already approved by the board that were sitting in prison. Um, please know we're trying to do everything we can to get these individuals out and, and get them safely into the community and keep our prisons <clears throat> at, a, at a point where we can uh, contain a spread. But, um, you know, those discussions around compassionate release, that's something that I think um, some time ago, uh, the governor had a group together that actually talked about compassionate release. Um, but she, you know, really, She's, I think her, she's relying on us to uh, work with the Board of Parole and get, get, get as many individuals out in a very safe manner and to make sure public safety is at that most, uh, at most importance at this point. Are there any other questions? Before Dr. Skinner? We I'm sorry? Dr. Skinner, I could add that uh, through our electronic medical record, we're able to pull data on disease states that are at high risk. And we have done that on a consistent basis um, and submitted those names as well. But as Dr. Skinner pointed out, some of the people are on life sentence and it, uh, that's caused uh, issues in their release as well. I, I, can I just ask a follow-up question given what you both commented on, which is, um, is there a role for the board and the Department of Corrections to work with the governor's office and the state legislature to push for something that's more structured? I mean, I guess what does what does this agency, this board, see its role as in terms of advocating for a more permanent solution, which is going to increasingly be a problem as our well as illnesses come, like the pandemic, but also as the population in Iowa starts aging in prison. What I can say that, you know, we, can, we continue to, well, always continue to have discussions with the, the governor and legislators around issues like that. And, and you're correct, we, we do have a population that is going to be aging in place, especially in the next few years and as we battle COVID. But uh, we are certainly open. And I know, I know the governor and legislators are all, you know, have, have concerns as well. So we're, we're very open to having those discussions, um, open up those discussions again and here in the future. Um, but, you know, at this point in time, we're, we're doing everything we can to safely get people out. Hearing no other questions, I will move on to the open discussion by board members. And I think, Mary, you mentioned that you had a question. Yes, uh, my question is um, along the same lines of, I think, the previous comment uh, regarding uh, felons who have, have had their voting rights restored. Um, I know there's many organizations in the community that are helping with, you know, voter registration and, um, and everything that, that is around um, uh, mobilizing um, uh, uh, individuals to uh, exercise their right to vote. 
and uh, is there, and there's a concern about, you know, doing the right thing and not uh, uh, making an error in um, uh, registering someone that isn't eligible. So is there any um, guidance or information um, that would be helpful in, in terms of like asking the right, you know, what questions to ask uh, to ensure that you are uh, um, uh, doing the right thing? Because you don't want to register someone to vote and they're not eligible. I mean, so I don't, I know you're saying that as uh, 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 individuals are released and they're given the, um, you know, the paperwork or whatever, but um, in terms of, you know, just helping and educating organizations that are working with reentry that are doing voting. So what kind of, uh, mm, what could be helpful in asking the question um, as they work with these individuals um, uh, in, in um, being prepared and having a plan, um, you know, to vote. Mm -hmm. Mayor, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, we've taken some significant steps here just in the, in the past few months in terms of the data exchange with the Secretary of State and then um, building in education um, documents into discharge paperwork. But I also think, and it's something we've talked about for some time, is also working with counselors and par uh, you know, parole officers uh, in the field on you know, guiding them where to go. You know, besides giving them a piece of paper, like what websites have the right information? Um, I would love to see some of the um, you know, nonprofits, uh, grassroots organizations that there's a lot around corrections to help engage in that education and that advocacy process too. Um, we can do our education at our point, you know, when these people are, are leaving and letting them know if they're eligible or not, depending if they're, um, you know, if they're one of those exclusions, but to give them that information, give them the web website to go to get that information to the Secretary of State. But I think there's also a, a kind of more of a grassroots kind of nonprofit um, movement that I think that would be helpful in terms of educating. And also um, the DOC does have a website, on our website we do have a link uh, to the executive order and quick links as well uh, for voting rights. And so that's something that we have posted on our website as well. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, we, you know, we see this in, as very important as a part of reentry and, and uh, reintegration back into being a, a full member of society and that voting is an important piece of that. So we wanna be able to support that in any way that we can. So um, does that answer your question? Um, somewhat, um, because there were, um, you know, the, uh, like the nonprofits in the community are, you know, really anxious about um, uh, assisting uh, in this effort. And so, you know, the, the caution comes with, you know, if, if uh, a returning citizen, um, you know, approaches and saying they're, they want to be registered mm -hmm. and, um, do they bring paper with them to do that? Or do they just know that they are eligible to vote? I guess that's the question. Then. Yeah, I mean, I mean they, could, they could go to our website and see if they're eligible or not. Like, again, there's exclusions for like that's homicide a, a and, and you know, special sentences and stuff like that. So, but there, uh, if, if they have, um, and I know, I, I believe, and Cord, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think they're going back in time in terms of those that have discharged uh, felonies we're not doing that, but I believe that maybe the Secretary of State is doing some work on that, but we're going current time now. So we're at basically saying, you know, if you're discharging, you know, a felony, you were sending your information over to Secretary of State, and then you're automatically eligible. You don't have, you, my understanding is you don't have to apply or anything, but you can get mm -hmm. on a website and see if there's some criteria that might make you ineligible because of a certain type of crime you committed. Cord, are you on the phone? It's put mm -hmm. you on the spot. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that correct? Um, in a nutshell, yes. So we've, we've given them an updated list um, through actually Sarah helped lead that effort um, of those that this would affect that was basically retroactive. So those between the executive orders, if you will. So they've got all that because the governor's order applies to them. 
and at the Secretary of State's office, and then everybody going forward, they have that updated list being pushed regularly to them of those that are discharging. So they have that information available to them. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that I think for people that are unsure, um, you know, we put in the letter that they're receiving in their discharge paperwork, there is a number to call. If you don't know if you were convicted of a felony and discharged that conviction, most people know that, but there are some that might have some confusion. Well, I had five aggravated misdemeanors and sent me to prison. Was that a felony? We can tell you, we put our phone number on there and they can call us and we'll go, no, you didn't have a felony. So you're good to go. Um, now they can also use traditional means that maybe you or I might use, Mary, which is call the secretary of state's office. How do I register to vote? Uh, call your local auditor. Um, hey, I live out here in this county. What do I need to do to, to vote? Um, because in a sense, there's always gonna be questions. I think for a lot of people, um, can a 15 year old vote? You know, they might have that question. And so we have to look for information and find information and, and call places that have that information or find it on websites. So our website links to the governor's executive order. If they come to the DOC website, um, the secretary of state's website provides information for people that executive order seven uh, applies to. So they can get some information there, including who to call if they're still not sure. Um, so I think that information is out there and, and, and to, to, your point, those nonprofits, they're the ones that are going to be able to fill in the gaps between government, the, the prison authority here, and the people that this is really impacting. And groups like ACLU, um, I've talked to Daniel about this, and they're working on that um, already. I think other groups like United Way and so, so on, they're really going to help fill in that gap. And if there's anything we can do to help them, we're on board fully. I can't wait to link to some of that information from our website to say, here's a great resource. Um, a guide, if you will, that's more user friendly than anything that I could produce that makes more sense to people on the ground that got convicted of a felony 15 years ago, and they already have the right to vote, but they might not know it. Um, so we want to partner with those agencies uh, for sure. And that means, um, and just some clarity, because they, you know, the, just some of some in the, the general population um, are misinformed, can be misinformed about um, you know, the eligibility in terms of, for instance, at Fort Des Moines, um, if they're uh, um, um, staying at Fort Des Moines, then they're still incarcerated or and not eligible to vote. So that's, you know, or not. So that was, that was the question. Mm -hmm. um, so if yeah. they're still at, if they're still um, a resident in Fort Des Moines, in fifth judicial, fifth judicial district, then they're still not eligible to vote. Is that correct? If it was a felony that put them there. Okay. Yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments? So this is Daniel from ACLU Iowa. I just want to quickly respond to your, your inquiries, Dr. Chapman. So as a legal matter, the moment you discharge your sentence, you're not incarcerated, not on probation, parole, supervised release, or subject to a special sentence, your right to vote has automatically been restored. Now, just like the rest of us, you have to go register and you have, you're subject to voter ID and all of the other election laws, but your legal right to vote has automatically been restored. Um, I put my contact information in the chat box. I'm happy to, we do presentations about this. We're happy to talk to organizations, to groups, um, to answer questions, um, to make sure people have the most accurate information. And so please feel free to reach out to me or share my information um, because we're happy to make sure people understand what their, what their legal rights are. Thank you for adding that, Daniel. Are there any other comments, concerns, or questions by board members? Yeah, this is Larry. I, I guess the only thing I was uh, is uh, when we set our next meeting to concerning the budget, I would like uh, uh, to have presented to us uh, the prioritization. Uh, so that's available to us as well as a draft of a letter to the governor um, as far as along the lines of what we normally send to the governor concerning recommendations so that we have the whole package when we're looking at the budget at that point in time. Thank you for that, Larry. 
We will get that done. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anything else from board members? If that is the case, I would um, ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting for today. So moved. Move. We, I, I, I second. <laughs> Thank you, Larry and Mary. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Thank you. And with that, we will adjourn until um, I was going to say October 2nd, but the board members will most certainly be um, called to get together in the interim and we will take care of the budget concerns at that time. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.